Hello, everyone. I am Asla Korkmaz, and I assist Dr. Oral at NUS Center of International Law. With that note, uh, welcome to the webinar on a conversation with Ambassador Nasat Shamim Khan on the Human Rights Council and Small Island Developing States, Challenges and Opportunities. The moderators for today's session are Dr. Nilifar Oral, Director for NUS Center for International Law, and Professor Patricia Galvoa Teles, Associate Professor of International Law at the Autonomous University of Lisbon and an adjunct professor, senior researcher at the NUS Center for International Law. Without further delay, we will now begin the webinar and I hope it to be enjoyable for all of us. Thank you so much, Azul, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from whatever you're watching. Uh, it's really a delight uh, to have with us Ambassador Nazat Shamin Khan that I will introduce in a moment. And I'm, uh, let me start by saying how grateful we are for you to have taken time out of your business schedule to come to talk to this uh, um, event uh, that is part of the CIL Distinguished Speaker Series. Ambassador Nazat Shamin Khan is currently President of the Human Rights Council. Uh, she is the permanent representative of Fiji um, at the United Nations um, in Geneva. And she was appointed as ambassador and permanent representative um, to Geneva when the mission of uh, Fiji first opened in uh, Geneva in April uh, 2014. Uh, before that, uh, she had been um, uh, director of public prosecutions in Fiji and the first woman to have that post, as well as uh, she had been uh, the first woman in high, as a high court judge, a position that she held until 2009. Um, I have to say that from um, uh, the CV that we've shared also with participants, uh, since her appointment as permanent representative of Fiji to Geneva, um, uh, Ambassador Ken has um, supported the work uh, of the Trust Fund for Small Island Developing States and the least developed uh, countries. And she also has been uh, very active in supporting and, and advocating for more Pacific Islands and SIDS to become members of the Human Rights uh, Council uh, to make it more inclusive and more representative. I could go on um, uh, with um, uh, uh, um, Ambassador Khan's achievements and, and work in the context of uh, the Human Rights Council, uh, but I want to save time for a conversation that of course will include some questions uh, regarding precisely the role of um, uh, SIDS in the Human Rights Council and the challenges and opportunities. So I'm um, delighted on behalf of CIL and in particular of Nilofer and myself, uh, to welcome you, Ambassador, uh, to um, thank you also again for your time. And I'm sure we're going to have a very interesting conversation. We will um, ask you a few questions. And then if time allows, we will also invite our participants to uh, put some questions in the Q&A box. So let me start um, at the beginning by asking you, and, and, and uh, maybe some of our participants are not so familiar with the work of the Human Rights Council. So let me start by asking you a bit about the, the mandate and also the current work of the Human Rights Council. Ambassador, please. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Patricia. And as we say in Fiji, Bula Vinaka to everyone. Uh, it, good morning. It's really a welcome um, event. And I also want to congratulate the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore for organizing this event. It's really very refreshing to see that academic institutions are interested in the Human Rights Council and recognize the important role of the Council in promoting uh, human rights everywhere, including through academia. So um, thank you and congratulations for organizing this event. Let me uh, turn to the mandate of the Council. The Human Rights Council was created by the General Assembly and it was created on the 15th of March, 2006 by a resolution. The resolution said that the Council is responsible for promoting universal respect 
for the protection of all human rights and fundamental freedoms for all, and that it should address situations of violations of human rights, including gross and systematic violations. And the, in fulfilling this mandate, the resolution said that the Council shall be guided by the principles of universality, impartiality, objectivity, non-selective selectivity, constructive international dialogue, and cooperation. So that's a bit of a mouthful, uh, but very important principles upon which the Council rests. Following this, on the 18th of June 2007, the Human Rights Council itself adopted a resolution, 5-1, and the annex to the resolution sets out the way in which the Council would fulfil its mandate. And in particular, um, it addresses the important contributions of the regular sessions of the Human Rights Council, the special procedures process and system, and the universal periodic review system for the fulfilment of the Council's mandate. So if I may, I would like to begin with the role of the regular sessions, which are convened three times a year, and which provide an opportunity for all member states to share views on a range of human rights issues. And the range is really from economic, social and cultural rights to civil and political rights. And I'm sure later um, I will receive questions about the way in which these rights sit with each other. It's an important issue. But for the moment, I will say that this is a very, very interesting debate in the Council to hear the views of different member states on different sorts of rights and their relationship with each other. The regular sessions also provide an opportunity for member states to negotiate resolutions. And these resolutions mandate reports and activities on both thematic issues as well as country specific human rights uh, issues. And at the conclusion of each regular session, the 47 countries which serve as members of the Council then consider whether or not they will adopt these resolutions with or without amendments. So that takes up uh, quite a few days, as you can imagine, at the end of the regular session. But the debate around the adoption of resolutions in itself is a very important discussion about what states think are important, uh, what priorities are important, and how different countries have red lines in relation to certain language. So again, we can come back to that uh, perhaps later on in the webinar. Let me move on to special procedures because I am a great um, supporter of the process of special procedures. I believe that the special procedures mandate holders have shown great flexibility in dealing with their main mandates in the context of recent and contemporary issues. So special procedures mandate holders fulfill their mandates. Again, the mandates range from thematic issues like the right to food, um, and to the right to freedom of expression and expression and also freedom of um, different types of rights as well as violence against women as well as country specific human rights situations. And the role of the special mandate holders are to consider these thematic issues and report back uh, and advise the council. In addition to that, special procedures mandate holders can also make country visits. And these country visits are very helpful because they not only report back to the Council about what they found, but very importantly, they make recommendations to the country concerned. And it is these recommendations which can be an important guidance for countries in their own human rights journeys. Important, contemporary, and very, very, very crucial in the work of the Council. I have to say that there is sometimes considerable, considerable pressure on special mandate holders. Um, to make their findings in a particular way and their courage and their determination must always be celebrated because without the independence of their voices, their objectivity, uh, the Council, I think, would be a poorer institution. Let me move on to the Universal Periodic Review. The Universal Periodic Review is a mechanism of the Council whereby every country, which is a member state of the United Nations, um, submits itself to a peer review process in relation to its own uh, human rights journey. And every other member state of the, human rights of the United Nations, whether or not they are members of the Human Rights Council, offer recommendations to the state under review. This 
Universal Periodic Review is uh, a process which goes through four year cycles. And so often when we have processes in the UN system, recommendations are made and then they disappear and they sit on some dusty shelf somewhere. But the, one of the strengths of the Universal Periodic Review is that when states under review come back in four years time, they will invariably be asked by the same states which made the recommendations, why haven't you implemented our recommendations, which you accepted? And so it's, it's a very um, constructive dialogue with all member states of the United Nations. And it also has its own inbuilt monitoring and surveillance system, which allows states to implement human rights recommendations uh, in order to really strengthen their own fabric uh, national fabric for human rights. So it's a very important process. It's also an equalizer. The most developed countries with perhaps some very good stories to tell on human rights, uh, but um, would, would submit themselves to the same review. And during this review process, and I've sat through many of them now, through this review process, it's apparent that every single country in the world has some weaknesses when it comes to human rights implementation. And that gives other countries great great courage and strength because you realize that we all have a story to tell. We can all do better. And it's this constructive dialogue with the UPR process that really helps countries to do better. So it's an equalizer. And again, the UPR process is often referred to as the crown jewel of the Human Rights Council. In relation to the current workload of the Council, I have to say that coronavirus was a challenge to us all and to all institutions in the UN system. But I'm very pleased to say that despite coronavirus, the council has continued to sit, to work, to um, have virtual negotiations. And some of the negotiations have become hybrid. So it's part partially in person, partially virtual. But I have to say that member states of the council and observer states and every other stakeholder, they've all shown great flexibility and great determination that the work of the council should continue. And in continuing this work, I think what we're saying to the world is that all of a sudden a conversation on human rights cannot stop because of COVID-19. In fact, COVID-19 has exacerbated human rights challenges around the world. And if we don't have that discussion now, it will become an irrelevant discussion and extremely um, academic, if I may use that word, uh, if we have it when it's all over. So the fact that we were able to continue through the COVID-19 crisis means that we have sent a very important lesson, a message to the world that the council remains relevant and operative and that it hasn't lost any of its strength. So having said all of that, over to you, Professor. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for presenting us in a nutshell the, the mandate of the um, of the Council and also its uh, current work and, and especially the challenges with the, uh, the COVID pandemic and the importance of institutions like the Human Rights Council and other UN institutions um, uh, being able to continue to perform its function. Uh, let me focus now, I said in the introduction that uh, you've been a strong advocate for more Pacific Islands and SIDS um, uh, becoming members of the Human Rights Council to make it more um, uh, inclusive and representative. Um, and I wanted to ask you, you know, what do you think it's the significance for the Human Rights Council to have uh, for, for the first time in its history, a president from a small island uh, developing states, um, how important it is for, for SIDS to have um, high profile uh, roles in UN bodies, such as uh, in your case as president of the Human Rights Council and also now with the news that we've heard recently uh, of the election of the foreign minister of um, Abdullah Saeed of the Maldives as president also of the General Assembly uh, starting from this fall. Um, what do you think it's the significance and what could be the contribution? You're still muted. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for that question. And you're absolutely right. Um, I am a great believer in amplifying the voices of small island states um, in the world. I think that if you were to try and negotiate a result as a small country on your own, then you're less likely to get a re any kind of a resolution or any kind of result unless you were able to use multilateral institutions. And so I think because small island states get strength 
from multilateral institutions and the processes of negotiation. It, it shows you really that uh, small island states are going to be the greatest advocates of multilateralism. It works for us because we know that together we can make a difference. And I do have to say it's a matter of great pride that His Excellency, the Foreign Minister of um, the Maldives has been elected president of the General Assembly for the 76th session. It really is an achievement for a small island developing state. And I feel very proud whenever a SIDS ambassador or representative um, achieves this kind of recognition, because it means that at the end of the day, we have made a difference. I think it was the founder of the body shop who said, if you think you're too small to make an impact, try going to bed with a mosquito. And I think that's it about small countries. We might be small, we might come from some of the most remote regions of the world, but actually to, together we make a difference. And the second aspect of smallness is that often small island developing states have very specific development issues. And in relation to human rights, this conversation about development and human rights and also specifically in the context of the effect of climate change on human rights, I think this is a conversation that we need to have in the multilateral institutions because it matters to us. It matters to us because every small island country, when they, when they talk about um, a tsunami or a hurricane coming, this one event can have such a devastating effect on the country's GDP, its ability to live, deliver on the SDGs and the way in which it prioritizes progress on human rights implementation. So I think this is a conversation we cannot have enough of because there are so many small island countries, so many small countries in the world, which have this particular relationship between development, rights and climate, the environment. And I know we're going to talk a little bit more about climate and the environment later, but I do want to say that because small island states have become much more prominent in multilateral institutions. The Human Rights Council currently has five SIDS as members, which in itself shows you how much progress uh, SIDS have made. I think because they've done so well, it's a, it, it, it really does help to amplify the kinds of difficulties that uh, SIDS have in relation to these multilateral conversations. I have to also say this, that because so many SIDS recently have served as leaders as mu of multilateral institutions, I think that's really helped the world to understand that we might come from small countries and remote countries, but we are capable of leading um, international institutions and capable of bringing countries together in a conversation which might perhaps be a lot more difficult if we were not SIDS. So often I think that SIDS have this important role in negotiating results. And that is often we are not seen as having um, any uh, very difficult political agenda, although it is arguable whether climate change and human rights has been difficult and whether despite that, we have been able to achieve results, at least in Geneva. So I think uh, an important role for SIDS, I think there's been important progress for SIDS, and I think that it's really um, showcasing the fact that multilateral institutions um, have added value with leadership from SIDS and that in turn, they add value to our national journeys for development and human rights. Over to you, Patricia. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for uh, those insights. And it's really, I think, um, you say it well, I mean, the fact that some states are smaller than others, um, it doesn't mean that uh, their voice should not be heard and, and of course amplifying those voices by acting um, in multilateral forums is, is key to um, having uh, the important agenda of uh, those countries uh, taken up uh, in such forums. So I will ask um, uh, Nilofer now to continue uh, with the next two questions. Thank you, dear Patricia, and may I take the opportunity, Ambassador, to welcome you. Uh, we are absolutely honored and delighted to have you part of our Distinguished Speaker Series. And already uh, in, in this time, we see so much um, to learn from you as well on this very important topic. And I was just listening to you uh, on this, um, answering the second question, and indeed, <clears throat> The small island states have been a powerful voice in the climate change 
and sea level rise. And we know that from the commission as well. But I just wanted to take the opportunity to also remember someone who was a great name in the law of the sea, and that is the late ambassador Satyanandan. And uh, the center has just uh, published a book, and uh, his last book, and, and so I think we'd be very privileged to send that to you. Anyway, let me continue, but I wanted to, I remembered him and, and uh, really what, just to amplify what you said about the leadership that does come out of the small island states, and he is certainly one of them. Now on the topic of climate change, which is uh, obviously such a priority for um, the small island developing states and um, um, really for the world, but particularly for the small island developing states, can you give us an update on the work of the Council on Human Rights and Climate Change? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and this is such an important issue. Fiji had uh, the presidency of the Conference of the Parties of the UNFCCC in 2017. And uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, sort of negotiation platforms that we adopted was that we wanted to see some outcomes on this intersection between human rights and climate change. So we wanted to have a discussion at the COP about how climate change affects women how it affects people who are indigenous and indigenous communities, both in relation to how they are involved in the planning and participation process and also the impact of climate change on indigenous communities. We wanted to talk about how it impacted poverty and poverty cycles and how it had an effect on small farmers, the backbone of a small developing country. So when we, we had started to have this discussion at the COP, we were told, don't talk about human rights here, not by any specific country, because there was quite a, a big body of opinion that thought that we should talk about this. But there were some countries which said, no, 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 you talk about human rights in the Human Rights Council, not here. Here, we are only interested in climate, as though you could divide these issues, as though you could talk about the climate without asking ourselves, what is the impact of climate change on people. So because that actually is how climate change manifests itself. It manifests itself in the way that it removes the quality of life from people. And those people who are already at a disadvantage because of poverty or because of gender or disability or age or the fact that they're indigenous, those people are actually disproportionately affected by the ravages of climate change. So I'm very pleased that we succeeded in 2017 in having some very good human rights outcomes at COP23. Uh, and then uh, almost at the same time, we were able to create a group of countries and this was led by Costa Rica at the time. Uh, and uh, this, this group of countries um, formed what is known as the Geneva Pledge. So these were countries represented here in Geneva and the, they were countries that were committed to having a conversation about the relationship between human rights and climate change. So the Human Rights Council has not been backward in this conversation, but we still get countries, of course, which say, be careful, we don't want to affect the climate negotiations. Let's not have any conversation in Geneva at the Human Rights Council that is going, to, that should be had in Bonn. So in Bonn, we're told, go and have this conversation in Geneva. And in Geneva, we're told, go and have the conversation in Bonn. Anyway, I'm very pleased that the Human Rights Council did not drop the ball on this. And in fact, for the last 10 years, there have been yearly resolutions on uh, climate change and human rights. And at the latest session, which was the 47th session, which has just completed, there was a panel discussion, which had been mandated by a resolution last year, on the effects of climate change on older people. And the panel discussion featured the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Special Representative of the Secretary General for DRR, and the Independent Expert on the Enjoyment of All Human Rights by Older Persons. I was very proud to chair this panel. It was a very good discussion on the way in which climate change constitutes a, a terrible um, uh, harm to the rights of older people. And also there was a very good discussion about how older people were affected disproportionately from the effects of climate change because of the way that society, unfortunately, the society has not always looked out for the rights of older people. 
So just last week, uh, on the 14th of July, the Council also adopted a resolution entitled Human Rights and Climate Change. And this resolution reaffirms the Council's commitment to advocate for combating climate change and addressing its adverse impacts on the full and effective enjoyment of human rights and recognizes the importance of climate action in the work of the Council. The resolution also requested the Secretary General of the UN to submit a report to the Council on the adverse impacts of climate change on the full enjoyment of human rights of everyone in vulnerable situations. And so really this builds on a very large body of work that the Council has undertaken on human rights and climate change. And increasingly, there is a growing consensus. So on this last, in fact, most of the resolutions have been adopted by, by consensus. In this last resolution, there was a call to a vote, but 46 of the 47 members of the Council voted in favor of the resolution and there was only one abstention. So no one voted against it. And I think that does show you how important this conversation has become in Geneva at the Council. And increasingly there is discussion about whether or not we should have a special rapporteur on climate change. Of course, we already have one on the rights of indigenous people. And there has been increasing conversation about environmental rights in the context of every other right. I do also want to say that in addition to what is discussed at the regular sessions, many mandate holders have now incorporated the impact of climate change on their mandates. So they've shown this flexibility, for instance, a special rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights has produced a report on the impact of climate change on the human rights of persons living in poverty. So we're, we're seeing not only um, the work in the regular sessions, but we're also seeing special procedures really showing this openness to addressing the issue of how climate change has an impact on every right. Um, and I think that we all know that. We all know that on the ground, in the field, in our countries, we know that everyone and everybody's rights are impacted by climate change. So it's what I would call a realistic conversation. This is not something that sounds ideologically correct. It is realistic. It is exactly what is happening on the ground. And those of us who come from small island developing states and experience many tsunamis or hurricanes or storms, we know, we know what this means. We know what this means to our people and how when we plan policy, we have to plan policy with a special eye out for those who are already vulnerable. So you must plan a policy for building resilience and responding to climate change with the participation of persons who are vulnerable and ensuring that those who are vulnerable do not have their vulnerability exacerbated because uh, you know, they're in a, a situation where they're responding to climate change. Internal displacement as a result of climate change is of course a classic example. When you have to move people from one place to another and if you don't look out for those who are especially vulnerable then uh, the, those uh, these these are the very categories of people who are going to be disproportionately impacted so i think the work of the council has been valuable in this uh, in this respect and i think that we must continue with it it's a very important conversation and i think that increasingly there is a strong support for the creation of a special mandate holder uh, for climate change. I, I'm interested to see how this conversation develops, but clearly with the very strong support for this last resolution, which uh, recommended discussions around the creation of a special mandate holder on climate change, I think that increasingly there will be a growing support for the idea. Over to you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, I think it would be very welcome to have this uh, special mandate holder and you've so wonderfully shown the need for an integrated approach to climate change. It cannot be siloed. Uh, it, the fact that COP was trying to say, no, it's for Human Rights Council and the Human Rights Council throwing it back. It's not mutually exclusive. And I think what was important is that for the first time in the Paris Agreement, the preamble actually made reference to human rights. Um, so I think you really have so uh, clearly shown why it's so important, the vulnerable groups. And we just saw last week in Europe um, what has happened, and we know it's climate change. And I, I, I recall um, an, an, an older woman saying she never thought this would happen in Germany. It happens everywhere. 
Uh, we're seeing that in, in vulnerable groups across the world. So thank you so much uh, for um, that wonderful explanation. And um, so the next, which I think um, leads into um, our next question uh, on the intersection between human rights and climate change is indeed very important as you've explained. Um, but there are also other environmental issues that have a direct impact on the full enjoyment of all human rights. Um, what about regarding the recognition of the human rights to uh, a healthy environment? Uh, what could be the potential role of the Human Rights Council in your view? And there have been quite a bit of development in this area. Ambassador. Thank you so much uh, for that question. Um, it's a very important one. Since 2011, the council has adopted eight resolutions by consensus on human rights in the environment. The most recent was adopted at the 46th session of the council in March of this year. But very importantly, the second of those resolutions appointed an independent expert on the issue of human rights obligations relating to the enjoyment of a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. And since that resolution, the council has continuously extended the mandate of this mandate holder although the title is now the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Environment, and of course, uh, currently it is Professor David Boyd. The mandate exists to identify challenges and obstacles to the global recognition and implementation of the right to safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. So central to the mandate is whether we should have a global recognition of this right and how we most effectively implement that right. And uh, as the mandate shows, the Council has already provided for work which is aimed at the recognition of this right. But I think recently, I think particularly with the concern that the world has on the way in which human rights and the environment intersect so closely, I think there's been increased um, concentration of interest on the issue of the creation of a right, specifically by a convention. So one report of the Special Rapporteur, which was presented to the General Assembly at its 73rd session in 2018, found that the greening of well-established human rights, including the rights to life, health, food, water, housing, culture, development, property and home and private life, everything really, has contributed to improvements in the health and well-being of people across the world. And that work remains to be done to further clarify and more importantly, implement and fulfill the human rights obligations relating to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. So the Special Rapporteur has pointed out to us on several occasions that the majority of states in the world now have this right in their national constitutions and are already implementing them. So in fact, an international recognition, a global recognition, would be quite logical in the circumstances because most, most countries already have this right and often need assistance about what it means. And so therefore the creation of a global right would really help individual states in the implementation of the right which is already in their, in their national law. So the Special Rapporteur recommended that member states of the United Nations consider three options regarding the global recognition of this right. The first is a new international treaty, such as a proposed global pact for the environment. The second is the possibility of an optional protocol to ICESCA. Or thirdly, a general assembly resolution, which focuses on the right to a healthy environment. So three very practical recommendations, uh, which would uh, further implement this right and really cement it in this, this global, um, arena of human rights. In addition to that, a, a group of nearly 40 special procedures mandate holders, from the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Environment, to the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, uh, to the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants, have endorsed a joint statement just in June of this year, which call upon states to take urgent and timely action to recognize and implement the right to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment as a vital response to the current multifaceted environmental crisis. And I'm so pleased that the, the rapporteur and, and all of these, the 40 rapporteurs describe this as a crisis. 
again, something we all know to be true. So crises need a very, very strong and very quick solution. And so I think the mechanisms around the council have really worked hard around this global recognition. And already the council is playing an important role, but this is of course a member state driven process, the recognition of a right. But I think much impetus has already built up. I think a great deal of support has built up across regions. And I think momentum is building on a global recognition to the right to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, and speaking of the Global Pact of the Environment, both Patricia and I have been involved in that. So we're following the development in that closely. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador. And now I turn over to my dear colleague, Patricia. Thank you. And, and I, perhaps I can't resist in a bit of a follow-up question, if I may, on this issue, because I think one of the, uh, I know we're going a bit off script here, but I think it's, it's worth asking the question, the um, uh, one of, I mean, both Nilofar and I, as you know, we're both members of the International Law Commission also. And when we look at, um, you know, the state driven processes and the difficulties that we see um, in, in having new treaties, uh, new treaties, you, you said that the options that were put forward for the recognition of the right were either um, a treaty like the Global Pact for the Environment, and so far that has not been. Um, able to move forward as, as, as a treaty. There was an attempt and some negotiations, but um, for the moment, um, there's not, not a consensus to pursue, at least for now. Uh, we hope in the future we will have an opportunity, but at least for now, the, the, the Global Pact for the Environment, where there was a proposal for the recognition to the right to an healthy environment, uh, the other option of a protocol, um, an optional protocol uh, to the uh, Pact uh, Global Covenant on, on the Covenant on uh, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and the other option of a General Assembly resolution, which was, for, for example, the case with the um, recognition of the right to water and sanitation. It was done through uh, a General Assembly resolution. Um, I think there's really a dilemma. I don't know if you want to comment on that, on, on the best way forward in terms of going for a treaty or going for first the political recognition in the General Assembly resolution, because um, uh, we also see that um, that states at, at this very moment, they are not too inclined for, for new treaties. So I think there's probably a, a better chance uh, from um, the point of view of having something quicker uh, for general assembly resolution, but I don't know if you want to comment on that. It's just something that uh, I think it's a common concern for all of us that work um, uh, with um, progressing international law, developing international law, be it in you know the area of, of, of climate change, of the environment, human rights, or other fields. How to move forward when we see that states have uh, more resistance uh, with regard to assuming binding obligations and treaties. Ambassador, if you want to comment um, uh, in a way that it pleases you, but I think this is an important question. Thank you so much. And you're absolutely right. It is an important question. Look, uh, I come from the Pacific uh, and uh, the, this relationship between the environment and human rights and the ambition of Pacific Island countries, I think is well known around the world. So I would say that the, for in my region and certainly for SIDS all over the world, they want the best and the most ambitious result as quickly as possible. But I'm also a realist and I'm also a strategic thinker. And I know very well that if you jump in right in at the deep end, you perhaps may not get the kind of support that you would if you took it a little bit slowly. So uh, I think probably the resolution is the best step forward. But in the meantime, I think you're probably going to find a lot of countries in the world who are really worried about the environment and have taken steps to um, really have this global multilateral conversation. I think you'll find a growing impetus for a, a global um, institutional response beyond a resolution. But certainly I think a resolution is a good first step. 
Thank you so much. Um, and I think this is a very important, also, as you said, from the strategic point of view, um, how to get the results, um, how to be realistic about the results, but how never to um, uh, prevent uh, states from being ambitious and from um, aiming for the best legal solution. And, and I think that's very good. And, and I hope, I think uh, we we are in, um, in a moment where uh, things are still a bit... Uh, there's certain inertia, um, but hopefully uh, we will get uh, that momentum that is growing and building. And I think this would be a very important development. So let, let's go back now to like, again the big picture about the Human Rights Council, a bit where we started, and um, but more looking into the future. As you explain, the Human Rights uh, Council it's still a rather recent institution. It had uh, its predecessor in the Human Rights um, Commission. It was already an upgrade in 2006. Uh, when the Human Rights Council was created, but there is um, um, a need, I mean, and there's an, in the agenda, there will be the status will is up for review by the UN General Assembly. Um, and this needs to be done between now and 2026. Uh, so when the Human Rights Council will be 20 uh, years old. Um, what, what will the council uh, contribute for this uh, review uh, process? Um, what are the ideas that are on the table for the review pro process? Where do you think it, uh, um, it could go, uh, that review process, with regard to the status of the council? Ambassador, please. Thank you so much. Um, and, of course, another very important question. The review is to be conducted, of course, by the General Assembly, as, as you point out. Um, but uh, an important question for us here in Geneva is whether the council is going to contribute to that review. And it's very important because this again is a member state driven process and we try to do as much as possible by consensus. It's very important that I this year get an idea of what the states want. Um, and uh, I conducted an informal exchange of views on this issue about whether the um, Human Rights Council should contribute to the review process, and if we are going to contribute, how that's going to happen, in, in what format. My informal exchange followed an earlier in, informal exchange, which was conducted by, which was presided over by the then President of the Council in 2019, His Excellency Ambassador Kohli Sek of Senegal. And during this exchange of view that I held, uh, I found that there was a variety of views on both issues. Firstly, whether we had something to say, and secondly, if we did, what would, how could we say it? In what way? Um, there was no consensus. Different views have uh, emerged very clearly, but I think it's an important conversation that we must continue to have because 2021 is already at the beginning of that review process, and one hopes that it will not be rushed, of course, right at the end. Um, but we have not been formally requested uh, for input on that review process, um, and I, I don't know whether we will be, but I do know that there is no consensus on the issue of whether we should contribute. Over to you. Thank you very much. We'll be in suspense waiting for what happens <laughs> in the re review process. Um, uh, but of course, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's a, a timely discussion also. I mean, the council has had now um, almost 20 years experience and it would be important uh, to see um, uh, the future um, work of the council and how that could uh, be impacted also um, uh, by by this review process. Um, so I don't know if Nilifert, do you have any in, any question? There's there are a couple of comments and, and questions in the chat that I'm going through. Um, I don't know if you want to ask something, Nilifert, as we prepare to um, move for the questions from our participants. Thank you, um, and Patricia. I could have many questions uh, because I think we've opened up so many important issues and the ambassador has really given us a, a rich array of uh, experience and information. But I think I will allow now time for the audience to ask some questions. So I'll withhold my own questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've been going here through the Q&A box. Uh, there are some, some uh, interesting comments and, uh, and questions and maybe I'll start with one. I'll, I'll uh, use my moderator's privilege and uh, start with one, which I think it's a, uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, um, it's about whether you could share 
um, any two concrete successes, stor success stories of the Human Rights Council. Um, I think that's something also that for the general public, it's interesting to see what would be concrete examples as success stories. So Ambassador, um, if you could think of uh, two good examples where uh, the work of the council has been relevant and successful. Thank you so much. Um, and um, I could actually hold forth on this because I am such a great fan of the Human Rights Council and what it can do. Uh, we have moments, of course, of discouragement, but it has the potential of making so much difference to the implementation of rights around the world. But I will confine myself to two examples. One is the number of countries against uh, which um, there were country-specific resolutions without the consent of the country. So originally there was a resolution which was um, commenced by other countries where a concern was expressed about human rights violations in that country and the country concerned would take the floor and say there's absolutely nothing wrong, you've all got the wrong information. But within a few years that resolution, which is a country-specific resolution without the support of the country has moved to an item 10, which is technical support and capacity building with the consent of the country. That to me is, shows great success because it shows that eventually human rights violations are ultimately the business of the country concerned. They will be, the country concerned is in the best position to be able to make changes on the ground. And when you get the movement of a resolution like that, uh, you know, from something that is uh, really quite combative and it moves to an item 10 showing that it's possible to have cooperation, it's possible to have a constructive discussion with a country which is accused of, of being guilty of human rights violations. To me, this is progress because it shows that within our processes, we can have this kind of dialogue and this kind of discussion and move resolutions into something which ultimately is going to be of great assistance to the people on the ground. The second is the relationship between the council and the implementation of human rights on the ground. So one mechanism I've already uh, gone through, but another of course is the UPR. The UPR is an excellent way in which uh, member states of the UN can make recommendations. And I have to say, I have to use Fiji as an example here, just to fly the Fiji flag for a minute. When I first arrived in Geneva in 2014, there were no recommendations on climate change and human rights through the UPR process. Now, more and more countries are making that recommendation on, you know, why haven't you talked about climate change in your UPR report? Do you have a climate change and human rights policy? What is it? How are you going to help persons with disabilities who are impacted by climate change? very specific questions. So into the agenda through the UPR process and therefore into the national agenda comes a conversation which hasn't been had before. To me, this is a really important success story. And another mechanism for implementation on the ground is this relationship between mandated res resolutions and field work. So the field officers, the resident representatives of the OHCHR on the field have this re responsibility to translate the work in Geneva to the regions for which they are responsible. And they do it in such um, a, a very, such a clear way, such an accountable way, such a transparent way. I, I'm in great uh, awe of the way that this is done. I think this is a success story of the Human Rights Council. Thank you so much. I, I think you touched on, on extremely important um, issues. The first one on, on when countries go from a negative position towards a more positive position in terms of seeing also an opportunity to um, improve the human rights situation in their country and also through the important issue of, of, of technical assistance. And, and then also the, the, the UPR processes and how that also helps um, uh, states uh, to um, have, I think, a more open mind also to what are the important issues and the recommendations that come from their peer, because the, U the UPR is really a peer review uh, mechanism. So as you said, it's, it's a great equalizer in the sense that uh, all states um, get to be examined, but all states also get to make recommendations uh, with regard to other 
um, uh, other states. And so it's a learning process both ways when you're examining, but also when you're looking at other states. So I think that's a, that was, a, and it, it's certainly something that didn't exist in the Human Rights Commission. And it's, it's been one of the great um, uh, novelties of the Human Rights Council. And I think that this has been uh, also a game changer in that sense that, that, that you have states at the same uh, level. One of, one of the questions in the chat, I think I can try to interpret it using again my my human my 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 mother it is a privilege um i think it has to do also with the fact it's 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 um it's a criticism that we often hear about the council and about men membership of the council because of course it's a limited uh, number of states that get elected um for uh, periodic terms in in the council uh, when you have um uh, countries that are elected that have um, a more negative uh, human rights track records and, and whether they should be elected as members of the Human Rights Council. Um, this is a, an ongoing discussion, um, I think, every time that there, um, there, is, there is an election. So what would you say to that? I mean, what, what is, I mean, every state has a right to be elected, of course, and, and to be a candidate. Um, it, it, how do you see this 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 uh, current criticism that is done uh, to the council uh, when it elects uh, countries that are perceived as being um, uh, countries that have human rights uh, violations and abuses? Thank you for that question. And of course, um, we've had many discussions around this particular issue, and we've heard the criticisms of some states in relation to the membership of the council of other states. But I do want to say this, that I haven't yet come across a country in the world with a perfect human rights record. Uh, not a single one. Uh, you only have to sit through the UPR process to know that we all have problems and that we all should be judged not by the fact that we have problems, but by our determination to deal with those problems. Are we taking steps to uh, eradicate the problems that we have? So I think it's it's very important that, you know, we can't get very holier than thou on this issue about who's better, who, who's the perfect human rights country. Secondly, human rights records and your commitment to human rights implementation is a relevant criteria in the election of members. So when we lobby to become members of, of the council, we do need to set out a very clear uh, timeline for how we see our problems and what we're doing about them. Having said all of that, it's a member state driven process. If member states of the, of the United Nations uh, would rather have the Marshall Islands over Fiji, that's a member state driven process. And of course the process as everything in the United Nations is highly politicized and we know this. But thirdly, let's talk about the council as it is now. We don't have a uniform view on everything in the council. We have a diversity of views. And I am in favor of hearing the diversity of views. It would be a very, very boring council if every single member state of the council had exactly the same view on everything. For instance, if you're hearing um, the views from the African group, you're going to hear a very, very strong cry for international recognition about racism and about people of African descent. Naturally, that's a priority. If you hear from another region, you will hear a cry about poverty and the impact of poverty on the, on the implementation of the SDGs and human rights. So it's really important that we're sitting in the council to hear everyone's views and everybody's views you know, is not going to be a uniform set of views. So I think diversity is actually one of the strengths of the council. And I think it's important that we hear everyone's views. Over thank to you. you. So thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, I think we don't want to abuse your busy uh, schedule and, and the generosity that you had with us uh, this morning, Geneva time, um, and, and we would close here. Um, we really appreciate uh, this uh, conversation that we were able to have with you that uh, not only address the mandate, the work of the council, the future, future challenges, the impact of COVID, but also focused on two very important issues 
uh, that we also had uh, elected to discuss with you because we know from the point of view of, um, of SIDS and the challenges and of opportunities of being in the Council and, and the work of the Council, which is the question of the relationship between human rights and climate change and also the recognition of the right uh, to an healthy environment. So uh, we really appreciate um, uh, this conversation and, and your, your um, uh, in-depth knowledge and the, your insightful views about these important um, important issues from the point of view as well, small island developing states, but I think of the, the world in general. And uh, and I want to give um, Nilofer um, the, the floor for the last concluding uh, remarks. But from my side, again, Ambassador, it's been a pleasure and a great honor to have you with you. And uh, we uh, hope that this event, as you said, uh, helps um, 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 the academic, academic world um, and beyond also to have uh, more um, in, in insights about the work and the importance of the Human Rights Council. We really appreciate and uh, uh, congratulations again for the excellent um, uh, presidency that you've been carrying out under this uh, challenging circumstances. So over to you, Nilifer, uh, for wrapping up. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Patricia. I, I think you did a wonderful job yourself in in summarizing this really wonderful um, hour we've had together with the ambassador who shared with us um, not just this incredible knowledge, but also insight. And I think he really did give us a, 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 the broad picture of how climate change um, is evolving. Um, and human rights now is becoming increasingly an integral part of that. Um, and, and of course, the role of the small island states has been absolutely um, critical. There's no doubt about that. Um, so I think um, highlighting the role of small island states uh, within the climate change, within the Human Rights Council, but ultimately um, it's for all states. There's no question about that. This is a global crisis. So we know that the Human Rights Council is in excellent hands with you, Ambassador. Uh, and I look forward to watching you know, this very critical issue develop, including the right to a healthy environment. Um, it, it, to me, it's amazing that we're still debating this even, uh, but, um, but we've made great progress. And so on behalf of the Center for International Law, Patricia and all of us, we are very grateful that you took time from your busy schedule to share your knowledge. And we will do our part to continue raising awareness on these um, existential issues, really. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Best of luck in your work. Bye-bye then. Thank you, Bye. Ambassador. All the best for you too.